Welcome to Tech Cafeteria. Oh, right, thanks, finally. I wasn't sure I was going to get anything. The food is that good? Okay. Uh, welcome. Uh, today we have Tara Manisik from uh, the Cincinnati chapter of Women Who Code. She is the uh, founder and director of the chapter here in Cincinnati, so we're excited to have her. She's going to be talking to us today about um, ideas and strategies for companies uh, that want to diversify their development teams by hiring more women, which is an awesome thing. And um, at the end, uh, after the rousing applause for Tara, um, your lunch trays, you can just leave them where they're at and we'll take care of that for you. So I'm going to turn it over to Tara. Hi. Is the mic okay? Catherine in the closet? Cool. Uh, so the topic of today's presentation came up while me and Michelle were emailing back and forth and I was just going to come and talk about Women Who Code because I love it so much and could talk about it forever. But she prompted me with the question of how do we recruit women in the tech industry? And if you've noticed, Cincinnati's tech industry is growing and growing rapidly lately. And the resources that we're looking for aren't always the easiest to find in the city. So how do we get women <clears throat> into tech? And then how do we keep them there? So this is me. I am Tara Manisik. And I will stand mostly behind this podium because I took a speech class in college and they videotape you and make you watch it. And I found that I do a lot of this when I talk if I try to move. It says like, I'm just gonna stand here. I'm just gonna put my hands down and stand here. So hopefully the slides will be interesting enough that I don't have to juggle or anything. <clears throat> so I am a software engineer and I've been a software engineer at Modulus for two years, about two years now. And I was really lucky because when I was in school, they introduced us to programming at a really early age. Uh, I don't know if this looks familiar to anybody, but this is Logo. And I would love to say that after second grade, I continued on and completely mastered the field of computer science. But that was my last computer science class until 2009. So that's kind of sad. But also kind of great that, of course, I did get back into it. I was also lucky enough that my mom was a electro electronics teacher and an A-plus computer repair teacher at the local community college. So I grew up <clears throat> tinkering with breadboards and whatnot, which when I moved to Boston, I, I had gone to school the first time at the University of Cincinnati for marketing. And uh, basically, I thought marketing was a mixture of really loving math and really loving people. And that's not exactly what it was. So I, I realized that when they asked me for like my stock portfolio on the first day of class. And I was like, oh, what? So <laughs> I got out of that. And I uh, joined AmeriCorps and did uh, disaster relief for Katrina for a year. And then I moved to Boston and started working uh, at Harvard Law School because they needed technical staffing and they said, oh, we need them you to be able to do crystal reports. And so I googled what crystal reports was and said, I can do that. Um, and so I eventually learned that really quickly and then moved on to uh, an administrative position at an atmospheric research group and was able to take a class for super cheap through the extension school, which was um, screen-based and physical computing. Uh, and it was this great Professor Bakhtiar from MIT. And we basically just played with Arduino boards and processing, and it was amazing. And I got hooked, and I didn't stop. And then one day I had a degree. It was pretty cool. So, um, so basically, that's my story. That's Logo. Today, <laughs> we are going to talk about Basically, what's the current status in the industry today? Like, what do the numbers look like? Where are we standing? Then look at what the obstacles are, what we're trying to overcome, and then how do we go about recruiting women, and how do we go about keeping them in the tech industry? So there are going to be a bunch of stats, because if you look on the internet, there are so many statistics right now because we're doing this really weird fluctuation of like, so saying here, basically, 
over the last 25 years, the numbers for women with computer science degrees are decreasing. But 28%, uh, uh, the 41%, I think, is really exciting. Um, that's basically going in, it's just looking at Harvard sophomores that are uh, declaring, a uh, declaring the concentration in computer science, which is really exciting. Um, the thing is, when you go beyond that, though, and you look into the industry, you see that tech startups owned by women is a mere 5%. It's just, it's, it's minuscule. And the interesting part, I think, is this graph below, which is saying that 40% of these women that they, that they asked about this were saying that there's not enough time addressing the diversity in the workforce, whereas 82% of those men said that it were, that it was. Uh, and all the sources, I'll have all the slides here for if you want to read these articles, because they were really quite interesting. Um, and this one uh, was uh, an article on CNET, where they're basically talking about this golden number of 30%. And if you look at the overall women in the tech industry at these big companies, like you see 30, 30, 30, Google, Apple, Twitter. And one thing that they said about that is that why is that a, you know, a golden number? Why is that something that we keep seeing over and over in the tech industry? It's because when you have a room full of men, but there's a woman there, kind of glosses over the whole diversity thing. It's like, there's a woman here, see? You know, and it's just like, there's, Black Widow, there's one heroine, right? Then we've got one. We're good. We're golden. So maybe that's a hump that we need to get over. Because if you look at the census data, there's 50, like 59% of the US labor force is women. They're there. So then it's interesting to see the actual tech parts of those companies are almost, besides Apple, all under 20%, with a mere 10% at Twitter. So these are obviously things that we need to work on. And the really sad part about that is this statistic that 50% 50, 50 of the women in STEM fields eventually leave. And when they're saying it's because of the work environment, the hostile work environment, this isn't, this isn't blatant sexism. This isn't blatant stereotyping. This is a lot of, um, a lot of basically, sly and quiet and to the side remarks about things. or so the things that would make you feel isolated. And I I'm, I'm very strongly hope that it's not a conscious thing. Because nobody wants to make somebody feel isolated. Nobody wants to make somebody feel different and left out. But when you have that one woman in the room full of men, there's only one. How could you get more isolated than that? So it's like not very happy statistics. But this a very sad thing on top of that is how much it takes for women to get here in the first place. And that starts when we are children. And they have this statistic that is basically saying that a ton of girls are expressing interest in STEM fields. But by the time that they get to um, college, when they enter college, 0.4 of them are comp choosing computer science. Um, and this was, this is actually, a, I kept trying to find the source for these videos, but this was really interesting videos of little girls saying why they believe other girls don't go into science fields. And um, I, I'll find this video, I'll link it on Twitter, because it was really interesting. There's another little girl in there who was like, I opened my fridge with a Lego. She had this like awesome Arduino setup with built around Legos that you press the button and it opens her fridge. And it's like, oh, this is amazing, the future. So um, <laughs> one of the other stats, I swear I'm going to get more upbeat in a second. These are really pretty sad statistics. But they did this study. And they basically, uh, for, they followed these young girls for seven to 10 years and had them go through these math courses and had their classes math papers graded by their teachers who knew their names and then an outside source who graded them without knowing whose papers they were at all. And over and over the teachers 
graded the girls lower than the boys and had more markups on the girls' papers than the boys. So it's this subconscious thing that is happening in our society or around the world, really, that this is a big, this is a big, big, big stepping stone that we should work on for the future. But that is a whole nother talk. Um, and then another thing I wanted to touch on was why diversity matters, especially in the tech field. But I feel like all of you know that. <laughs> so um, I linked this article because it, it touches on tons of points of uh, just sticking to timelines, um, basically figuring out different ways of approaching products and projects. But they basically have almost every part of a process of building a product and why diversity helps it. So I highly recommend this article, and I will post that as well. But these are the topics that I really want to talk about, because I talked to a few women on um, Slack and read a bunch of articles on what do we actually do to recruit women? Like, how, how are we not doing it right currently? So I'm just going to touch on each one of these and explain them a little more. So create a united front. Basically, what's that, what that's saying is you can't just have one person like, can you head up bringing women in? Can you take care of that while we do the regular stuff? You have to make sure that everybody's on the same page, like really have the whole team understand why it's important, why it's, why it's a good idea to have you know, not just a monoculture in your workforce, but engage uh, more people on your front of with a strategic way to bring in all kinds of people. Um, this one is kind of funny to me, because I don't know if you've seen any of these. Make your job as women friendly. Now, if you haven't seen this in person, you may have seen it on an imager or Reddit feed. But it's basically when you see uh, job ads that are, um, we're looking for a really friendly dude. She's like, wait a second. Or it's just like, uh, we really want a wizard to do this or that, and which you shouldn't use wizard anyway. But, um, but it's basically, you know, you'll, they'll use he, and they'll use things that are basically saying you're looking for a man. And it's blatantly, it's kind of like, did anybody read this? Like, did somebody proofread this before you sent it out? It's a little, uh, it's, a, it's, it's interesting to see that those, when you pick that up as a woman and you read it, you immediately go, well, that's not for me. <laughs> like, they're not addressing me. They're not talking to me. So advertise where women look. What this means is there are women organizations here in this city. There's GDI. There's WWC. There are places where women are. So advertise there. Talk to them there. Like that's if that's who you're looking for, there are outlets for you to go to. And there's there's uh, there's the women. I'm pretty sure there's the women in technology meetup. There are just tons of places around here that if you want that audience, that's that's where you go. That's where you put your information out there. Uh, this was actually so I got this from uh, this is a socialtalent.com article, and it actually said create family. Uh, create women-friendly benefits programs, but I think more importantly is to create uh, family-friendly benefit programs. And the reason I say that is me and my coworker were talking about this one day, and he said, you know, it just makes no sense to have maternity leave because you're singling out women to take this paid time off. Why wouldn't you just do paternal leave? If you do paternal leave and it's just like anybody that is a parent has time off to take care of their kids, when a woman comes in to apply for a job, you're not automatically going, well, does she look like she's going to be pregnant soon? Which is weird, one. <laughs> but two, if it's men or women have equal opportunity to take that time off to take care of their children, take care of their family, then you don't have that upfront bias. So. I know that is also kind of a big topic right now in general, but think about it. Um, so this last this segment, the last one, take sexual harassment seriously. There's a ton of cultures in the workplace that don't get called out on all the time. 
Um, and that's not good. You know, there you can't just uh, brush over or you know sweep things under the rug that could be offensive to anybody. And this, I mean, this happens with ageism, with sexism, um, all kinds of isms that are bad. Um, but if you take the time to really talk to your employees and make sure that everybody's comfortable, it's not, it's not, it shouldn't take that much time out of your day <laughs> to make sure your employees are happy. Um, and this last one talks about uh, promote your current female employees. And I'm not saying like promote it to another level. Basically, it's saying when you have women that are doing well in your company, talk about them. You know, show, show the community that, yeah, women are doing really well in this workforce. They're in these positions, and they're doing this and that. Uh, when you're looking for a job, you know that. You know companies, one, that have women working there, and you, you're aware of how well they support them based on how they're promoting them. So those are the big, those are the big topics on that part. Um, and we can, we, we, well, I don't know, if, if anybody has any like immediate questions, we can touch on that now. No? Cool. So this is a very long uh, Slack message, but I, I really wanted to put this all up here. And I usually try not to have words in general, but um, this top one, was always seemingly surprising to people, although I've heard this, and I'm, I am this, so many times. Basically, it's saying when you write a job recommendation, you have this wish list of so many things on there. And uh, some of them are pretty hilarious. But um, so yeah, it's, it's basically when men, they, they say, when men look at this job recs, They'll go halfway down and go, yeah, golden, good. I'm going to apply. I can do this. I'm pretty sure I can do those other things, but I got, I got the first half. We're good. Whereas women will see like up to a 90% fit of like, well, they're like, well, I've never used balsamic. I guess I can't do this. And you're like, what? Balsamic? But anyway, um, so there's, there's this thing that we have to be aware of because we're not all looking at the job uh, requirements the same way. And what she says in this second part is basically saying um, to be sure that what you're looking for in your employee isn't just this list of things. It's kind of a lazy way to do it, to be honest. Like if somebody asks you what job you're looking for and you can't say it within two sentences, it's kind of, you're kind of being a little too verbose. Like you know what stack you work in. You know what job, like, you want them to maybe be familiar with a programming language for the past three years. It's like, oh, that's a start. So maybe, maybe don't cut off all of these people that could be coming in to go after your job because you're looking for these specific things. So I really like this point that basically it's opening up your range of people coming in dramatically anyway by getting rid of this. And I mean, I know recruiters love to, I know they love these lists and like look at LinkedIn profiles for that whole list of whatever and whatnot. But don't you want more people to come in and vie for your job? Don't you want to talk to as many people as you can to figure out who's coming in that's worthwhile for this job? So that's basically uh, what she's saying here. And I, this was again from that social talent article. And it's basically saying that talented women out there exist. If you're not seeing them, do something about it, change. And so that's when I get into my favorite part, which is Cincy Women Who Code. So this is basically, um, when I first moved here to Cincinnati, I had been part of the Women Who Code in Boston. And I wanted that here. I thought it was really important that we uh, basically build up the community that we have. And uh, like GDI is doing a great, a great job of getting women into tech. 
and then we can handshake and continue women's education on once, you know, and we kind of focus on women who are familiar with, you know, at least a programming language, and we try to do as many um, advanced workshops as possible. Uh, so, yeah, we just started up and just started doing meetups and started having free workshops because why not? Women Who Code is this nonprofit that's worldwide, and the whole purpose is basically to connect women who are in the tech industry to other women who are in the tech industry. And I can vouch for so many times we've had meetups for the Women Who Code uh, organization that have just been code togethers or mixers. And just being able to talk to more women in the industry just feels nice because it's more people like in your shoes going through what you're going through that you can relate to. And that just feels nice. Uh, they have all these initiatives about broadening the tech community and um, putting women in a position to teach, to speak, to learn. The biggest thing is learn. We love learning. Uh, and they're all over the world. So we're very excited to add the Cincinnati chapter to that. And then, um, so this is our meetup page. And I highly recommend checking it out and seeing everything we have coming up. What am I on time? I may be wrapping up a little short. These are the workshops we have coming up. Um, <laughs> so this June, we're doing a TDD uh, workshop uh, with Catherine in the closet. And uh, then in July, we're doing React. Then we're doing some Angular and NativeScript to build iOS and Android. Uh, got some Pi workshops, Node. Uh, portfolio building and continuous integration. And so these are the kind of things that we're trying to, the biggest thing that we want to do is teach and to advance knowledge and to keep current. And that's how you keep women in the industry. So not only is it the continuous learning and always being on top of things, but it's that community. It's really important to have a community of people that you relate to, that you get along with, that push you to do well in your career and remind you why it's really fun and great, <laughs> in case sometimes you forget. Um, and we, these are always free. We will always make these free, uh, no matter how much it kills us. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, we, we actually care about this extremely strongly, so we want to do this. Like, all of us that are doing workshops are doing it because we want to share the knowledge, because it's important to us to teach, and it's important to us to learn. So if we want the resources to learn, we know we want to give back and teach. And we're always open to anybody wanting to give a workshop on uh, what they want to do. But we do keep women at the forefront. So we do have women teachers, because it's important to us to for other women to see women in that position, because that doesn't happen too often, sadly. So if we can do that, we're going to continue to do that. Um, and uh, we would love <laughs> any kind of help you ever want to offer. Uh, when we ask for sponsors for Women Who Code Workshops, all that means is we would like a space for us to code in with Wi-Fi and food. And that's all we ask. Uh, there is no uh, actual monetary value that you need to give us. There's, uh, you don't have to plan the curriculum or anything. And you can also pick and choose which workshops you want. And if you have ideas for a workshop that you want, we can bring those in. And what that basically gets you is not only are you supporting uh, the awesome ladies in tech in our community in Cincinnati, but um, you're also introducing these women to your workforce. So you're, it's part of that recruiting is bringing, letting people know that your company exists and that you have a diverse, uh, you're open to diverse communities. And so it's kind of a hand-in-hand -hand thing that uh, we think is very important. So well, there is my information. Always feel free. If you or your company or anybody has any questions, wants to do a workshop, wants to give us ideas for a workshop that you want to have, email me about that. 
Uh, you can email me any of uh, pictures of your dogs. I like that. Uh, and any other questions you have whatsoever, please just always feel free to email me. Um, and that's it. <laughs>